let's delve into this broader theme of what the role is of the shape of space and navigation. There's a very particular role in something called reorienting. We're going to spend some time talking about this because I'm mildly obsessed with it, as you will see, and because there's some very, very beautiful recent work on it. Okay, so this is called reorienting, uh, and it's, uh, the word is actually used a bunch of different ways, but the key way that we'll use it here is this is regaining your orientation in space once you've become disoriented, as Vicky, I believe, raised a while ago. Yes. Um, so um, this is a really important thing. If you're a navigating organism, you need to keep your bearings. You need to know not just where you are, you need to know which way you're facing, or you can't possibly figure out how to get anywhere else you care about. So the classic example, which probably most of you have experienced, you're in Manhattan or a comparable grid-like, you know, Cartesian-oriented type city. You come up from the subway, you know where you are because you know what subway stop you got out at, and maybe you sort of recognize the look of the place when you come out, but then you look around and if you're like me, you're like, uh, you don't know which, which street is which. How many people have experienced that? Oh, good. Pretty much everyone. Okay. That is the problem of reorienting. Right? You don't know which way to walk down the street until you know which way you're facing. It is essential for navigation. Okay? So it turns out there's a whole neural system for solving that problem. Not just for Manhattan, but for the natural environment version of it where it evolved in uh, all, kinds, all kinds of animals have this. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what's involved. So here's kind of aerial view. You're standing in Manhattan. There you are. You're facing this way. Um, and you have a cognitive map. You know your way around Manhattan, more or less. Okay, so there's your cognitive map in your head. Okay, and you know your location in it. Right, you got off at that subway stop. You know where you are. That's not the problem. Okay, you also can see what's in front of you. You can see there's a street like this. You're facing right down a street. The problem is, how do you orient that cognitive map to this street you're looking at? Okay. That's the problem of reorientation. It could be <coughs> like this, boom, looking down the street that way. Or it could be 180 degrees apart, like that. And you don't know. Okay? So that's the problem of reorientation. Animals in natural environments um, face this as well. It's not, you know, with big long lines like it is in Manhattan, but there's a similar version of that problem. Okay? And so because this is a fundamental problem that navigating animals need to solve. There's a whole brain system for doing it. It's a beautiful classic work. Okay, so the early classic work on reorientation was done in just simple behavioral experiments done in rodents uh, by Ken Cheng and Randy Gallistil back in 1986. Again, I mention it because Gallistil's my dear friend and I think this is an amazing study. Um, you don't need to know it. Okay, so here's what they did. Um, they put rodents in a rectangular box, much as you guys got put in a rectangular box when you came into class. <laughs> okay, um, but unlike what happened with you, the rodents were given some food in a corner of the box, okay? Um, the rodents are then taken out of the box and disoriented. So it's not, you don't grab them by the tail and swing them around. <laughs> you just put them in a closed container and turn them around enough times that they lose their bearings. They don't know which way they're oriented. Okay, then you put them back in this box here. Okay, rodents are not dumb. They care about food. They remember there was food in a corner. They go back in this box and what happens? They look for that food. And what you see is they look for it in these two corners, 50-50 in those two corners. They don't look in those two corners. What does that tell you? Very low tech, simple observation, but it's deep. What does the rodent know? What is he using? to choose the corner that he looks for the food in. You get rid of all the smells. He's not using smells. And furthermore, if he was using smells, he would go only there, and he doesn't. What is he doing? Uh, yeah, he's using the shape of space. He's got some kind of mental representation that is something like the left side of the short wall. Like it's not in words. It's in whatever rodent ease, right? Okay, but it's something tantamount to the left side of the short wall, of which there are two, and there's no possible way he could do better. Yeah. Annie? Yeah. Anna, okay. Does it matter like, which way you put the rodent in? Like, if 
that and like where it's oriented if you put it in because like, I imagine if you like put it in so like that's the upper right it would go in that direction but if you put it like on it's a good point there's a huge debate and there's a whole bunch of people who study this stuff and there's a huge debate where a whole bunch of them wanted to say it's just your visual representation of you, you sort of a snapshot of that corner and you just go toward the snapshot um, but there's a bunch of work in fact I'll show you some in a bit that argues against that that argues instead it's not just that you have a snapshot of what that thing looks like and you go into the corner accordingly no you have a mental representation of the whole rectangle um, and you and the problem this rodent is facing is trying is how to orient himself in that rectangle he doesn't just as when you come up from the subway you don't know if you're going this way or that way he doesn't know which is which okay and so he chooses one of the one of the, on different trials he chooses different ones okay um, okay so that's you know sort of logical tells us he's using the shape of space but it's not astonishing next part is kind of astonishing now you do the same experiment but you break the, the, the symmetry you put some very rodi, rodent salient visual pattern on this wall okay and you repeat the experiment okay and you do some controls to show that the rodent actually encodes that uh, pattern there and I'll show you even better controls in a moment okay what do you think the rodent does here does he go 50 50 does he go to all four does he go to just one he's got the information like duh everybody get why duh he's got the information the symmetry is uh, there's no longer a symmetry it's broken he knows to go there now we can do left side of the blue wall right but that's not what the rodent does he still goes 50 50. that's surprising that's weird your first instinct is wait 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 he must not have noticed this oh no they do millions of controls the rodent absolutely knows about that wall and uses it for other purposes i'll show you one in a moment he absolutely knows about that wall he just doesn't use it to reorient himself when he's disoriented okay now you should be surprised by that the whole field was surprised it's deep and informative the big idea that came out of this work is an idea called informational encapsulation the idea is different parts of your brain are solving different computational problems and each of them has a different kind of logic and a different kind of representation and it accepts a different kind of information from other parts of your brain but there's a lot of regulation about what information gets into each of those modules of your brain and so the idea is that the reorienting system in the brain only takes the shape of space it doesn't take input from the features like the blue wall okay it's not set up that way and in fact if you think about it that's not a stupid thing if you think about rats in natural environments what changes I think I talked about this a little bit last time what changes with seasons right the features change the colors change the textures change leaves come and go snow arrives mud happens all kinds of different features change it's the shape of space that's a stable cue and so you might imagine that if you were designing a robotic rat to live in a natural environment you might want to build in a reorientation system that uses only the shape of surrounding space as the most stable cue not the features of the environment the rat is in okay yes it's a great question if you're wondering about that you're, you're getting it right that's the idea of informational encapsulation is there are constraints on what information can get where in the brain and this rodent you know is not stupid he's using lots of cues but he's not able to use this other information which is in his brain he just can't use it to reorient himself because reorienting is a specific problem solved by a specific module and that module does not have access to other information. Okay? Yeah. But, but if you do this experiment multiple times, can the rat be trained to know the blue It's a good question, and I forget the answer, but the, the main gist is no, not without massive training. Um, at least many, many trials is not enough. Mm -hmm. Okay? But it's very specific. Remember, this only happens if you disorient the rat in between. 
right? It's a very particular problem with getting your bearings again after you're disoriented. Okay, rats can learn things like, you know, next to this color or shape or odor, there's gonna be food. They can absolutely learn that. The particular problem they can't use this information for is using that feature to reorient themselves. Okay. Now, you guys are probably thinking, okay, stupid little rats, right? They have this informational encapsulated system that's really kind of poignant and pathetic. We smart humans, we can use any information to solve any problem. We're, we're very flexible. We would never have informational encapsulation, right? No. Okay, so Liz Spelke, who's down at Harvard, um, did this experiment on kids 18 to 24 months old, infants. Okay, so you need to do the infant version of it. You sit them in a rotating chair in a big room where you've broken the symmetry. <laughs> They're very cute experiments. Um, and you show the kid a desirable toy. Okay, it's very much the same experiment. Put them in the room, you show them a desirable toy in a corner. Uh, they do, just like the rodents, if, it's, if there's no symmetry breaking thing, they go 50-50 like that. Okay? Then you do the experiment after breaking the symmetry. It's been done many ways, but in one, in, oops, I'm stepping on the cord. Okay, in one case, they put red velvet on an entire wall, and they show the kids, when you knock on the red wall, music plays. Very salient, very exciting to an infant. They totally get it. They know all about the red wall. They know if you knock on the red wall, it causes music. And when you repeat this experiment, having made a big deal about the red wall, they behave just like rodents. 50, 50 to the two corners. Isn't that intense? Okay, so this evolutionary old system that uses the shape of space to reorient animals when they're disoriented is very constrained. It works in a particular way. It uses the shape of space. It does not use features. That's informational encapsulation. Okay. Now you may be thinking, okay, stupid little infants. We're not that surprised. What do they know? Actually, it turns out they know a lot, but it's a different topic. We'll get to more of that next, next week. Um, adults would never behave like this, would they? You wouldn't. You wouldn't be so stupid. You would, of course, notice that the, the thing that you want, the adult version, maybe it's a $10 bill, whatever it is, is to the left of the red wall. Of course you would know that. Well, sometimes you wouldn't. The specific finding is this. If you, have, if you tie up people's language system while they're doing this experiment, they behave just like rodents and infants. You do that using a uh, task called verbal shadowing. And so verbal shadowing, it's just like simultaneous translation, but you don't translate. So you can try this sometime. Listen to a radio with somebody speaking and just repeat everything that's being said with a lag of one or two seconds. It's surprisingly demanding. Like you, you just have to do all and only that pretty much. <laughs> um, and it really ties up your language system, okay? If you are doing verbal shadowing while you do this experiment, you behave like a rodent and an infant. Liz Spelke's interpretation of that which I don't think is true, but it's such a beautiful idea, I have to share it with you. Her hypothesis is that language is what enables us humans to, es escape, th to escape the confines of informational encapsulation. We can import information from one module and bring it over to another module using language that other animals can't do. That's her idea, it's a beautiful idea. She has done control experiments where you have other demanding tasks that you do at the same time for which the argument, at least, is they're equally demanding but not linguistic, okay? That do not produce that pattern. And so her claim is that it's specifically the language system that enables you to send information between modules. Yeah, Claudia. Where do you think it's Oh, it's complicated. Um, um, I don't know, I'm not sure. Be um, uh, I think it's very, very hard to come up with a, an alternative task that is matched for difficulty to the verbal shadowing task. She made a very serious effort. She did, I mean, she's utterly, she's a much more brilliant experimentalist than pretty much everybody, very much including me. Um, so I'm nobody to go criticizing her. She's just magnificent as a, as a thinker and an experimentalist. We'll talk about this more when I talk about language. Um, you can find people who are severely aphasic due to massive left hemisphere strokes who have lost pretty much their whole language system. And they can do this task. They don't go 50-50 to the two corners here, they go straight to there. So 
there's a bunch of lines of evidence. But then, you know, there counters, Liz can make counters to all of those, really smart counters. She can say, well, the, um, the aphasic who lost their language system grew up knowing language. That wired up their brain with this ability, even if now they've lost language, right? So that's a very interesting question, too. But I'm going to get back on track, if that's OK. OK, so um, all right, so I think that's what I just said, blah, blah. OK, so the key idea that I want you to take from this is, first of all, that it is spatial layout information that you use, that animals use to reorient themselves when they're disoriented. Um, and second of all, that this is the, the classic example of this big idea in cognitive science of informational encapsulation. Most people don't believe that information encapsulation is as extreme or severe as I just depicted it. It's more of an idea to consider. There are certainly some constraints on which information can get around between modules, and it may not be perfect. It's probably not quite as extreme as I depicted here, or at least that that's a, a rare case of it. Okay? But it's an interesting idea. Um, OK, and I, think I, I, I hope I made it clear why this would make evolutionary sense. To ha if you're going to build one of these modules for reorienting disoriented animals, you would want to build it so that the shape of space is what's used, because those are the stable cues in the environment.